Christ our cornerstone and on him we stand. Peter's going to talk about that uh, to us this morning as we pick up our Bibles and look in chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Uh, remember, we're coming off of chapter 1 where he is reminding us of this great salvation that we have in Christ um, that he has called us to himself to be separate from the world, to be set apart unto him. That's what that word holy means, just means to be set apart, and we're set apart unto him. And he speaks of uh, the fact that we came to him because we, we heard the word, and we love the word, and he encourages us to have a sincere love in chapter 1. And reminds us that all flesh is like grass. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. But what matters is eternally. But in, in the midst of this life, he goes on to encourage us in chapter 2, that because we are set apart unto Christ, because he's called us uh, to live unto him, we're to live separate from things of the world. And he, he lists about five different things here in verse 1 that he tells us that, that we should put away or we should cast off, meaning that uh, it was probably in our former way of living or our former thought life. But now that we've come to Christ, we have the Holy Spirit who convicts us of sin and empowers us to be freed from sin and has placed us in, in a walk with him. And it's the Holy Spirit by the word of God that bears on our heart what is right and what is wrong, or what's righteous, how to live a righteous life. But I find it interesting that the things that he calls us to put away are things that have to do with our relationship with others. Notice some of the words here that he uses. He says, put away all malice, all deceit and hypocrisy, envy and slander. These are actions that, or mindsets that we can have that have a bearing on other people. The first word he uses here is malice, and that word malice uh, means to do harm to another person. Uh, we typically think of malicious behavior or malicious homicide or malicious murder as being that it's bodily harm, but that word also carries the idea, and we can have malice against another where with our words, we try to bring harm to them or destruction to them. Notice he uses a second word in here that relates very close to that, and that's uh, to put away all, uh, all slander, to, to try to defame someone through their words. And, you know, in my experience in the body of Christ, um, we always look at putting away the external things, the things that... that and oftentimes are, are cultural things that we deem uh, right or wrong. But Peter doesn't mention any of this. He, he mentions things that, that he says are evil that we would do to other people. Malice, trying to bring harm to another person by the way that we speak of them or speak about them. Um, and slander, tearing people down with our words. Folks, this is really, this is evil stuff when we think about it. Uh, not only does it, does it affect that person, but in the body of Christ, it brings about great harm and great destruction. And I know even here it takes place and it happens, but can I tell you, based on the Word of God, we ought not do that. It is evil. It tears the body down and ultimately defames the name of Christ. So he says, put, again, put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy. Deceit. Uh, my computer just came back on. Put away all deceit. Deception, trying to deceive others. And along with that is hypocrisy as well. Uh, having the air of trying to project an image of who we are rather than being honest. It's hypocrisy. You know, you've all heard the thing, the guy says, I'm not going to church because it's full of hypocrites. And and I tell the person, if I ever hear that, yeah, you're right. It is full of hypocrites. We all put on an air sometimes uh, of wanting to project something other than we are. I found that there's great healing in life when we are honest and we have an honest assessment of ourselves. I don't want to be honest about who I am. And you don't want to be honest about who you are either sometimes. 
Um, but there is real healing in that. The Bible says, confess your sins one to another so that you might be healed. And so in, in relationship with confident people that I know love me and trust me, or excuse me, love me and I can trust them, um, there's a great freedom in being, just being real and being honest. And that's not to give an excuse for the way that we are. But it's simply uh, a matter of confessing that and recognizing that, uh, that, that, man, our hearts are wicked and evil and deceitful above all things. And that if we're not careful, we can be led astray with that. But that's a great weapon against the enemy to be honest and not to live in hypocrisy with that. Uh, nor to envy, uh, wanting something. Uh, it's more than just wanting something that somebody has. It's seeing something that someone has and there's ill will or ill feelings towards that person because they have what we want. And so he says, put all of that stuff aside. That's the way you once lived as an unbeliever, but now you come into relationship with Christ. There should be a transformation that begins to take place in your life. Um, that is evidence that we are believers in that we're uncomfortable in those things anymore. If you find someone who professes to know Christ and they are comfortable living in these things, it may be that they're not true believers, that they've not been transformed, they've not been renewed, they've not been born again. And so that's an evidence in our life that we've been born again. Then in verse 2, he says, like, like newborn infants, like little babies, long for pure spiritual milk. Now here Peter's talking about the Word of God. And so there is a longing that we should have as believers for the Word of God. Man, I, one of the greatest marks in my life when I came to know Christ was that all of a sudden I had an insatiable desire to know God through His Word. And Yes, it's easy over the years as being a Christian just to kind of gain a passe approach to scriptures, um, and that can wane. But, but let me encourage you this morning. Man, have a time in the Word. I know you all meet me every morning to have these devotions in the Word. That's great, but I also encourage you to go back and read these verses again, to meditate on them, to circle, underline, ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what do you want to say to me through this word? Is there something uh, that, that I need to hear and I need to respond to in your word? So he says, crave pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow into salvation, or you'll mature. There are only two things that bring the believer to maturity and faith. Number one, is the Holy Spirit of God working in us. And number two is the Word of God in conjunction with the Holy Spirit of God. I've met believers that have been saved for 50 years, and they are still like little babies. They've not grown. The reason they've not grown is because they've refused to discipline their lives to be in the Word of God and allow the Holy Spirit of God to work in their life. They may go to a Sunday school class and hear somebody else talk about the Bible. They may actually engage sometimes. They may sit in the services and listen to the message, uh, but oftentimes they become more critical rather than allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to their hearts by the Word of God. And so that's what grows us. If indeed you've tasted that the Lord is good, the Lord is good, the Lord is good, Taste and see that the Lord, He is good. Amen. He is good. Uh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Verse 4, as you come to Him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. Jesus was chosen to go to the cross for us. Um, he willingly laid down His life. Chosen and precious Yourselves like living stones are being built up into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. We're going to talk more about this tomorrow. To be a holy priesthood and to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, what are these spiritual sacrifices? Well, one hint to that is where Paul encourages us in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that that therefore we're to present our bodies as living sacrifices, our whole being to him as living sacrifices, 
holy and acceptable to him. This is your reasonable act of worship. So how do we define worship? Worship is not singing songs on Sunday morning. That's an expression of worship. But worship is our whole life being given and surrendered to him as a spiritual sacrifice. So everything that we do can be an act of worship. The question is, is whether it is presented in a manner to him. Paul said, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all to the glory of God. And so everything that we do is an act of worship. Do we glorify God through that, give him praise, give him thanks, give him honor, or is it for selfish motive and gain? You see, that's what separates whether or not it's worship or not. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone, speaking of Jesus, a cornerstone and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Hallelujah for that. Whoever believes in him shall not be put to shame. It's interesting he calls him a cornerstone because when a building is being built, that cornerstone is what every other stone is matrixed off of. It's what, it's what every other stone is laid against to determine whether that building is going to be square and whether or not that building is going to be strong and solid and withstand all the elements that come against that building. And so the application in our life is Jesus is our cornerstone. He has to be the he has to be the central focus, the central thing in all of our being. The Bible says that we move and breathe and have our being in him. Jesus he says is a cornerstone. So uh, the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected, they rejected Jesus as the cornerstone, has, be has become the cornerstone and has become a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. You see, the stumbling that he's talking about is for those that reject Jesus as a cornerstone. Um, that has its main application in salvation, but it also has an application in our daily living as professed Christ followers. He can either be that stone that we build and, and bear our life around, or he can be a stumbling, a stone that we reject and we stumble over him. What is it that Jesus is calling you or leading you to do today? What is it that he's calling you to set aside so that you might follow him closer in fellowship and relationship? You see, Jesus can either be a, a rock of security and strength, or he can be a stumbling stone if we reject his word. I pray the Lord blesses you today, keeps you, uh, Gail, I saw you come on this morning. I learned yesterday that your sister passed away yesterday morning. And so, Gail, this, that's Gail Brooks. Gail, we're praying for you. Uh, just praying the Holy Spirit's comfort in your life. We love you, Gail. Uh, you are a special person, and we thank God that you're a part of our body. And so, Gail, uh, as the Scripture exhorts us, uh, not only to rejoice with those who rejoice, but to weep with those who weep. And so, this morning, we are, we are weeping with you at the loss of your sister. I pray the Lord would give you an opportunity today to plant a seed in somebody's heart, a seed of the gospel, as you intentionally look for those opportunities that God might bring your way. Pray that God would use you to cultivate that seed that's already been planted, or if God, by his grace, would allow us to watch him save somebody. Man, that would make it a great day, wouldn't it? I love you. I pray the Lord's blessings on you, that he keep you. Have a blessed day.